the, uh, the title of today's talk, uh, I'm told, is, seems to be a little ambiguous. So what I ought to really start with and tell you what it's really all about. I was jealous yesterday um, when I learned that the Haven Center, which is sponsoring my talk, also sponsored Bernard Stiegler. Bernard Stiegler's latest book in English, which is called States of Shock. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Stiegler a little bit today. Um, I, I would have liked to have seen Stiegler, <laughs> but I was obliged to give my own talk, which uh, is unfortunate because I've never met Bernard Stiegler, but I have read a lot of his stuff, actually, recently. Um, and some of what I'm about to say today, not all of it, is really, to a, to, to a certain extent, um, influenced by and in dialogue with Bernard Stiegler. Um, we have a uh, we we have a difficult time right now. Hannah Rank called our time twenty five years ago, maybe a little longer. Um, you can't take me anywhere. Anyway, um, <coughs> dark times. She said these are dark times. Well, there was one. Several um, beams of light. One of them was the changeover in the British Labour Party uh, when a 35 year veteran of the Parliament, a left wing member of Parliament, of Labour Right, won the uh, leadership of the Labour Party. That's, that was in some ways. A beam of light, in my opinion. Um, another beam of light, which turned out to be not so light, and to a certain extent I was involved in that beam of light, was the victory of Syriza in Greece, uh, which has turned out to be very complex because the, um, the Greek uh, Greece is not a, a viable economy. It, it's got olives, and it's, and it's formerly had shipbuilding, but essentially it's, a, um, it's, an, it's, it's, an, it's an economy which is entirely dependent on uh, bailouts from the European, the Eurozone. Um, and when they try to build a political movement that was independent of the Eurozone, they got clobbered. And um, there's a split in, the, in, in Syriza, and there's a lot of complications going on. That, so that was a beam of light that became somewhat darkened by the uh, unrealistic expectation that in a country which is really, uh, in some respects, a dependent variable in the, in the uh, European economy, could actually strike out on its own without a whole cultural transformation. And I'm going to talk about those, some of those things. The third beam of light, which is a little, mo a little bit more uh, home, was the resignation of one of the worst secretaries of education that the United States has had, mm. Arne Duncan. That was a wonderful uh, move, uh, unfortunately marred by um, uh, Barack Obama's praise for Duncan uh, for having brought the educational system of the United States into the 21st century. That's what, um, that's what uh, Obama said. And what, it, what, that, and what Duncan represented uh, as a move to the 21st century was that the criteria for excellence of the education system in the United States was now to be de largely dependent on... Uh, The quantification, literally, um, of test scores. Duncan had become, in fact, the cutting edge of what is probably one of the most reactionary attempts to uh, uh, to uh, uh, 
pretend that there's a union, that, that there's a uh, an education system in the United States. If the digitalization of um, American education goes as far as it's gone, it is largely because Duncan has been responsible. Although there were tendencies before that, of course, that meant uh, that uh, that that means that. Uh, uh, the next Secretary of Education is going to continue Duncan's program because Obama, with, without much reflection in my opinion, um, will carry on this program, which uh, even the two unions of the uh, teachers, the National Education Association and the um, American Federation of Teachers, the two principal unions, um, have condemned because um, uh, when I say even, these are people very close to the Democratic Party and to the Obama administ administration, and yet the, the, the rank and file of teachers finds that this whole tendency to data-based results, that is the quantification of results as the basis for education, is abhorrent. And um, I think it's a hopeful sign. I don't uh, actually pay, I don't actually believe there's much hope for the American Federation of Teachers, although it's, it, it, it's a big union and, and the NEA is a little bit bigger. Um, and they, they, may, they may snap out of their slumber. It may be. Uh, it's entirely possible. I am a member of the American Federation of Teachers at the CUNY Graduate Center, and I have been. Uh, an elected officer of my union. I said this last night, 23,000 people we represent. Um, uh, I was on the negotiating committee. I have had experience with the AFT and uh, their condemnation of the, um, of the policies of the uh, Obama administration, uh, re-education, uh, is uh, commendable and yet they haven't done anything really beyond condemnation. Um, My, my subject today presupposes, as, and should presuppose, that there really is two large poles or two large elements in the constitution of social relations. The first element, which comes directly not only out of the Marxist tradition, but comes out of the um, neoliberal, neoclassical tradition in political economy, it, uh, it, it is the dominance of the of political economy. That is to say, the study of the relations uh, of um, production, um, distribution, and consumption in a society, and of course, if you want an economistic um, example of political economy in the world today, uh, you, all, all you have to do is look at the United States, and that's all, that's all that's ever, anybody ever talks about. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Growth, growth, growth. Um, profits. Of course, what we don't like to talk about very much is wages. Isn't that interesting? No, no wages. Well, because wages have stagnated now for 40 years. Um, but the second part of, of really what constitutes the, the con uh, social relations is much more obscure. It is obscure. In the, in the popular media, it's obscure in what politicians talk about. It's to a large extent obscure, except in most people's everyday lives. And that is what is sometimes called consciousness in the old term, but more recently is, is, is termed subjectivity. And subjectivity, in many ways, is as important as the categories of political economy for determining the constitution of a society. That is to say, what do ordinary people, what do 
intellectuals among ordinary people believe are the significant determinants, or at the very least, influences upon how we, how we live and how we act and, and what it is that it, it, it means our, our lives. How do we perceive what is going on? Both in politics, in foreign policy especially, and so on. Now, the popular view, and I suggest that, and I'm not going to suggest at all that the popular view is wrong. I'm going to suggest it is very partial. Is that one of the reasons that, or one of the great influences on the constitution of subjectivity, of, of how people see the world, are the media. The media now seems to have, in many of the commentaries, uh, a great deal of influence on how people see things. Um, and what it is, not only what they see, but also what they feel is important. And uh, I know that the Haven Center has had, or will have, I guess has had, McChesney, Bob McChesney here. And Bob McChesney has books and articles in which he believes the media is in many ways largely responsible for the constitution of subjectivity. He writes about subjectivity, but he doesn't write about it as subjectivity. He writes about it as the big, bad media. I don't want to, I don't want to attack that. I want to simply argue that it is only part of the story. What is also a very large part of the story of a story of the constitution of subjectivity, of how, why and how people act and feel the way they feel, are two things. One is the missing term in the critique of political economy. And that missing term is that is that there really is there really are two kinds of political economy. One of them is the political economy of the production of goods and services and the distribution of goods and services and its consumption. And the second part is what people like Bernard Stiegler, among others, Jean-Francois Léotard, who's now no longer among us, and Jacques Derrida, who is no longer among us, French philosophers, refer to as the libidinal economy. Now, what do they mean by the libidinal? Oh, of course, Deleuze and Guattari, who are both gone, uh, in, especially in the Anti-Oedipus and the, um, and the uh, Thousand Plateaus. What do they mean by that, the libidinal <coughs> economy? One of the things about, about economic activity as is generally understood, that is the production of goods and services and so on, that they have pointed to is that what people hope to gain from economic activity is the satisfaction of their needs, but the needs are not merely physical needs as we know it, they're not merely food, shelter, food, shelter and, and so on, but they are also psychic needs. People want pleasure. That's what they've called, talked about. And how, the question becomes, how do we achieve pleasure out of our activities? It is all, it is all true that people actually work in order to live. Increasingly, as people like Stiegler have argued, what has happened in our society is that people are living in order to work. Work has played such an enormous role in a, in a time of an economic crisis in our lives that we've lost contact with ourselves. 
that the, the libidinal aspects, the, the pleasurable aspects of life, are to a large extent missing in many people's lives. And the question becomes why this is. That's number one. The second aspect, which is, has to do with subjectivity, which is terribly important in the thinking of a lot of French philosophy right now, and not, not only French philosophy, but I've written about this extensively, and I'd be happy to tell you what is my stuff on this subject, is the role of technology. In my new book, for example, my recent book, I can't say it's the newest, but it's also in my new book. In my recent book on, on, um, on uh, uh, called Death and Life of American Labor, I argue uh, that um, the, one of the reasons the labor movement is in the drink, not the only reason, but one of the major reasons is they paid no attention to technology and they have actually accepted the idea that technology represents progress. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. They have accepted technology and accepted its results without really contesting what technology is in relationship to the labor process, for sure. But, but what Stiegler and others have begun to address, those and Grattery to start with, actually, is what technology has meant for the conduct of life. Technology is not simply machine tools for the purposes of production or delivery of services or for um, um, communication. Technology has become dominant in what Lefebvre talks about as everyday life. Everyday life is now dominated by technology. People have learned to have a relationship to the screen much more saliently than they have relating to one another. So that human interaction, or even interaction with other life forms, forget about human alone, but other life forms, has given away to what uh, might be described as a machinic uh, civilization that we're living in. And some people have begun to raise the question, and it's a very complicated question, as to whether our relationship to technology is such that we have now entered into a post-human age. That is to say, have we become no longer specifically human, but we have ourselves become machines? You could go back to Mary Shelley, actually. Percy Bysshe Shelley's partner, wife. And to a whole variety of novels and, and tracts which emanate from the 19th century, the 18th century even, if you take Rolson Crab, and find that the problem with our relationship to industrialization has been that the machine is not simply a tool, but the machine has become dominant over our lives. Not only our lives at work, and I could, and my work has been largely devoted to that. In a book that I wrote with Bill Lefazio called The Jobless Future, we illustrated, and now they've discovered it, I'm so happy, you know, now the Atlantic Monthly, 20 years after we wrote this book, says, hmm, you know, we're looking at a jobless future. And Bill and I uh, laughed and we said, duh. <laughs> Why they couldn't see it in advance is because, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, is because one of the things that we lack is theory. We have no theory anymore. People are A and anti-theoretical. They are, in fact, anti-intellectual. And part of that is because technology has begun to replace the struggle for knowledge. What is it about technology that Mary Shelley saw? 
we have built a simulacrum of ourselves, which, however, has served to take over from us. Who is Frankenstein? What is, what is the tale? Of course, obviously, it's, it's, it's part of a great fear. But at the same time, it reflects a, a, a reality. Now, let, let me just start a little systematically by talking about one of the first great commentaries on technology. The fragment on technology from Marx's Grundrisse. Uh, Grundrisse, 1857, it's 10 years before the um, publication of Capital, which is 1867. He wrote a, a whole first draft of the, um, of, of the book and then discovered that he had to rewrite it because he was going to do it in many volumes. Because the first draft was very complex and there were many formulations he wanted to look at again and the manuscript was to a large extent lost and finally revived when the Soviets bought the Marx archive and then published it in, in, in limited editions and then it got published again and then finally in the 1970s it was published by um, Penguin, we published, you know, it's a small book. It's only got about a thousand pages. But the fragment on technology makes one fundamental point. In his analysis of automation, remember 1857, his analysis of automation, it's also in Capital Volume 3, by the way. You can find it there as well. In his analysis of automation, what Marx observes is that in the labor process of that time, especially in the textile industry, but in the tendency, and I can go through the political economy if you want, but that's not necessary for now. In the labor process, humans no longer have a direct relationship to the production process. They have now been relegated to bystanders, to watchers of the production process. When did I learn this? I didn't learn it by reading Marx, by the way. I learned it because I was a representative for the Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers International Union. And I went into chemical plants and oil, and oil, oil, oil refineries all over this country. I was a roving organizer for a while, and I, you know, I organized in those, in those places. And what you find, and I represented the mobile oil workers in Brooklyn before they shut down the plant in the 60s. What you look at is nobody producing anything. The machine is a, a, self, a self-activating machine. The refinery has an average of 200 to 300 people. There are 25 refineries in the United States left after all the automation and technological change, and they produce all of the oil, most of the oil anyway, that is used in the United States. 25 refineries times 250 average, 200, 250 average. You think about how many people there are. The union's membership in the oil industry is 25,000, and they represent almost all the oil workers in the, in the, in the in society. 25,000 people produce all of our oil. And as I said last night, one-sixth of, of steel workers of 1960 now produce the same amount of steel that was produced in 1960. But the, but, the labor, but the production process is a machine process. The automatic factory, the automatic driverless car, 
the automatic activity of almost everybody who works as or drives or does anything, washing machines, for example, this has now become a, a norm. Technology is, the machine itself has become the worker. And the worker has become an observer. Anybody in this room have been to a contemporary automobile plant? All right, I'm going to tell you about contemporary automobile plant. All of the assembly is done by computer-mediated robots. All of the assembly. I worked six months at Linden, New Jersey's General Motors plant, and we had hands. We, you know, we 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 put in the the windshield wipers. We put up the tires with our hands. We. Um, pushed physically the body onto the line from the body shop. All done by machine. Mm. I, I gotta tell you, my father was a chemical operator for DuPont, an observer. W w uh, Jersey, South Jersey. No, uh, in Niagara Falls, New York. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. An observer, bored him to death, and, and killed him at 48. And, and, but, he, but he was an observer. He was an observer. That's, That's all. Right. That's, That's all he did. So, so the, so the, so this is simply from the production process, from the point of view of, of other things we are talking about. From the point of view of how we live our everyday lives, our interaction with technology has become a, uh, ubiquitous. And what that has led to. I have a student, his name is Ivan Zatz, and he wrote a dissertation about the screen. The screen. He said, what is happening now is that we are interacting with screens. The film was once an object of entertainment, but with the advent of television and with the advent of of, 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 of various um, uh, social media, as we call it, of the iPhone and, and, of, and, of, and, and of the internet and so on, our interaction are with smaller and smaller and smaller screens. And our interaction between television and those smaller and smaller and smaller screens takes up not only our working time if we work at those situations, but takes up our lives away from work. We are essentially watching and acting on machinery. I don't have to tell you for the sake of illustration what the new business is in education. Online learning. What the hell do we need a teacher for? If on one hand the teacher is teaching to test and has become essentially a technician of test giving, and on the other hand the student is bereft of any teacher except in an indirect way and has no, not even the interact in, interaction of a classroom, then what has happened is that our, our lives are being engulfed in the technology. That is a perspective that has to be taken seriously. The more advanced the society, is, it used to be that was the, was the case, but now the so-called third world is involved in the same processes. So the universalization of technological, um, 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 the technological sensor, sensorium is really beginning to be fairly well known. Stiegler makes the argument in this book, I can give you other books if you want it. Um, the sub subtitle of this book is Stupidity and Knowledge in the 21st Century.
And what he argues in this book is that the more machinic our lives, the more stupid we become. That is a conclusion that is very controversial. A lot of people don't like it. But he illustrates it pretty profusely. But the, it's got another aspect. And I want to get to that other aspect because technology is not good enough. Not enough. And he understands that. The second problem is that if the machine begins to take up, take over many of the functions that the intellect t took up, that is the generalized intellect. You know the term generalized intellect? That's Marx's term, by the way. If the machine takes over many of the functions of the generalized as well as the specific intellect, then the society becomes anti-intellectual. And when it becomes anti-intellectual, it becomes increasingly unable to address the problems that it faces. We live, for example, in the United States, more than any other country in the world, we are a war society. There has not been almost a single year since the American Revolution that we have not been engaged in some war or another. Maybe you could start with the French and Indian Wars of 18, 1761, where George Washington began to make his, um, his um, uh, reputation. We're, we're a war society. We're not just a war economy. That's true, too. But we're a war society. And that war society kills a lot of people, not only Americans, but kills people all over the world. The, murder, the, the, the killing has just go on and on and on and on and on. And the problem that that poses for us is why is it that Americans tolerate this kind of butchery? Why is it one of, the, one of the characteristics of our society is increasing specialization? I happen to be a professor of a field that has become so specialized that the field has almost no theory at all any longer. I won't mention historians because that, you know, that's, that's well beyond the, the pale. Um, nice stuff that they do, but even, you know, uh, not much. But specialization means that people are being trained at the intellectual level not to really address what somebody said to me, macroeconomic, macro-social, macro-cultural phenomena. People are being trained to become very specific and very, very, in a Greek term, idiots. Greek term idiots really doesn't mean, it means uh, specialized. So specialization is um, coincident with stupidity. We, we become increasingly unable to address, never mind solve, address the larger problems of the society as a whole. We have theories now that say there is no whole, there's no totality even a complex dialectical totality, even a contradictory totality, there's no totality. All we, have is, all we have is a new version of nominalism. What is nominalism? Nominalism is a theory which argues that everything is, is discrete and that relations are not, necessarily, are not necessary. Relations are usually relations of uh, accident. The problem, the problem, however, is this. We are habituated to certain practices. We go to school and our teachers are, in, in, in the university are perfect. The second part of this book is all about the university about university and responsibility. Our teachers tell us, 
as students, don't take up theory because you'll never get a job. Don't become a theorist, because if you become a theorist, you'll be unemployed. I am here to tell you that's a bald-faced lie. That's not even a, a half-truth. At, le at least in sociology, I can testify that I train theorists. I have them read Freud. I have them read Stiegler. I have them read Marcuse and, and, and Horkheimer, which I've been writing about, by the way. And they get jobs. It's a mistake. They shouldn't get jobs, but they do get jobs. And one of the reasons they get jobs is because to feel the so bereft of ideas that they welcome people who have at least even wrong ideas that they can be entertained with. And because they have to teach a little bit of theory because that's the nature of the, the, the sociology as a canon. And that, and that becomes an, another aspect of the stupidity, of, of, of the constitution of subjectivity. That we should go to school that we should enter educational activity for the point, from the point of view of getting a job is a very, very serious problem. And the reason it's a ser serious problem is because we do not, under those circumstances, cultivate iconoclasm. What we cultivate is conformism which Stiegler and Guattari and others have been pointing to. People really don't believe that they can have any genuine effect on the larger world, that what they can only do is what they can do in a very specific and a very, in a very narrow way. And the question becomes, if that is the nature of our situation, what is it going to be like when we have these terrible crises that we have to move away from, when we have to solve, we have to address? And I refer you, just as another example, to 2007 and 2008. When the finan I'm not going to go into the whole issue of the financialization of America. That, I have a student who wrote a book on the subject. His name is Randy Martin. And it's called The Financialization of Everyday Life. You may want to look at it, by the way. It's a very good book. But I'm not going to go into that. But what was interesting about 2008, 2007, 2008, is that there were very few economists who had a clue as to what was going on. They couldn't figure. They couldn't fathom it. They couldn't figure it out. And they were guided by a very narrow group of, of economists who were basic, basically conservative economists, who said that the solution to our financial crisis was to give money to the banks, to save the banks. And so they saved the banks. And now we're in a period, now we're in 2008 to 2015. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. We're in the seventh year. I think it's the eighth year, but that's a separate issue. We're in the seventh or eighth year of, a, of wage stagnation, of, of, of almost no growth of any substantial, of, all, of job creation, which is really of, of, of non-jobs. <coughs> of part-time, temporary, contingent jobs, of college-educated students who cannot find real, real, real vocation. And I give you an example of my daughter, graduated Wesley in 2006. She spent four years as a freelancer, five years as a freelancer, one year working for the Chicago Tribune, but five years as a freelancer before she got her first job with NBC News. She's a journalist, like her mother. NBC News didn't offer her, it was a one-year job, didn't offer her a second year because she was on a Gates Foundation grant. 
Then she got another job for another year, and it, you know, and now she's got another job for another year. She's now 31 years old, and she's still a contingent worker. She gets paid well, but she doesn't have any business. There's no such thing as job security. We're finding that the whole field of knowledge is being reconfigured so that there's very little available to anybody. There are no newspapers that have any viability except the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and maybe the LA Times is going down the drain any minute now. Of course, the Capital Times will always exist. <laughs> but, but they didn't have a clue. The liberal economists, the Keynesian economists, now have gotten a voice again a little bit. But the Keynesian economists are basically stuck in 1936, which is the year of the publication of the general theory of employment, interest, and money, by the way. Everybody should know that. They're still back to 1936. They talk, they talk this language, this language. We need to rebuild America's infrastructure, roads and public, public buildings, <coughs> and that will create jobs. One of my fields, by the way, happens to be work. I study work. Automation has not let the construction industry alone. Ever looked at road building? There's earth moving equipment built by Kia, for example. And there's a few people in the it, 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 it laborers. But the number of people who used to be in the WPA in the 1930s no longer exist. The construction unions have, have, de have declined by two-thirds, two not because they've lost the, job, the, the, the contracts, but because they've because automation and technological change have transformed the, job, the, the work. And still the politicians and the economists talk about infrastructure as job creating. Uh, what I'm talking about is not, it's not, to, not to get into that political attack and all that. What I'm talking about is the way in which our thinking has become adult, has become narrowed, has become tremendously um, um, ignorant. He calls it stupid. I, I don't call it stupid. They're just ignorant. And there are always individual exceptions. And they can be named. But it's part of the problem of subjectivity. How do we see the world in which we live. How do we understand what the problems are? How do we become more and more and more narrow in our outlook? Okay. In 1941, Herbert Marcuse who at that time was connected to the Institute for Social Research, which is popularly known as the Frankfurt School, in their publication wrote an essay. And the essay is called From S Some Social Implications of Modern Technology. It's an essay. And what he said is that technology is increasingly becoming a way of life and that that way of life is having enormous impact on, the, on our, on our economic situation, but more on our moral situation, on our intelligence, and, our, you know, and, 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 and the constitution of power in society. He repeated the argument again in 1964 in a book called One Dimensional Man, which sold 200,000 copies in hardcover. Think about it. And Part of the reason that he was able to do that, aside from the fact that he was a very, uh, you know, very good philosopher and a very smart guy, is because he was the assistant of, 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 of 
what some people think is the greatest philosopher of the, 19th, of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger, whose own essay called The Question Concerning Technology uh, is, 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 it reflects a similar kind of question about what technology means in human relations. And yet, and both of them point to the limitations of technology. Stiegler and, as a, and, and Deleuze and Guattari have, and Leotard to a certain extent, have extended that argument. Stiegler is a Frankfurt School follower with criticism, serious criticisms. But he, he always refers to, the, to, to their work on technology. But the, but the prevailing sensibility is that technology is going to solve every problem on Earth. It's going to solve health problems. It's going to solve employment problems. It's going to solve the problems of everyday life. It's going to solve everything we need. It's all going to happen with technology. And we should all lay back and enjoy it. And Apple is laughing all the way to the bank. But we must realize that much of the thinking that technology can solve all the problems is not a new, uh, not a new, uh, not a new um, uh, phenomenon. It's an, it's, it's an old phenomenon. But there was, there's a second phenomenon and a third. The second phenomenon has to do with the problem of believing that science, which is a, a we don't have any, any basic science anymore, what we have is techno science, that science is really part of the big solution. And no more interesting part of that belief in, this, in, in scientific progress is now taking place in the field of medical science, medical tech, scientific technology. My wife died of lung cancer. She never smoked. People dying of lung, of lung cancer all the time who don't smoke. The scientific establishment, I'm not speaking about individuals, the scientific establishment has promulgated a view of cancer and a solution which essentially believes that the dominant reason that people get cancer is because of genetic predisposition. And if we actually alter the constitution of DNA or find a way of altering that constitu uh, constitution, we're going to solve the problem of cancer. The alternative view is that cancer is a social disease, that cancer is a societal question, problem. The alternative to that, even, and people believe that, but they're not, they're not getting any real play is I think there were three things. There's pre genetic predisposition. There's the environment. The food that we eat, the pollution that people now realize is serious. Commo the co plastics, the commodities that we consume fossil fuels, all that people are beginning to get the idea that maybe that has something to do with cancer. The third, nobody believes. The only one who really did any extensive research on that subject is Wilhelm Reich in a book called The Cancer Biops Biopathic. And that is that there's a psychoanalytic, there's a emotional dimension to cancer. And to all disease. Not that it's the cause 
or that predisposition is, a, is the cause, or that the environment is the cause, but it is a complex of causality. That's a theory that has some power if you think about it, because there are people who actually, what Mark Russo said, in One Dimensional Man, and he was not a, a, a psychoanalyst, but he said, although he wrote Arison Civilization, which was a psychoanalytic uh, uh, meditation, he said that emotional questions have somatic consequences. What that means is that we cannot ignore the relationship between disease and our and, uh, uh, and emotional well-being. We have to examine the question of, and Stiegler is very specific about that, of the unconscious as, as a factor, as an <coughs> influence in how diseases emerge. You won't be surprised to learn that on oncology teams do not include psychoanalysts. They don't even include environmentalists. The oncology team is always in the major places like Sloan Kettering and NYU, and my wife was treated at NYU, Oncology Center. It's all chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And now they have the belief in the magic bullet. Magic bullet thinking, by the way, very interesting, right? Uh, we're, we're going to take a we're going to take a, an extract of the disease, and we're going to inject it through nanotechnology, and that's going to solve the problem of cancer. How silly can you get? But that's the that's the scientific establishment. We're going to have a solution to cancer by you know by medical means. They've never been able to solve, to cure cancer. Never. It's always a matter of, 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 um, of, um, of uh, five years, you know, and then maybe you get lucky. Even in breast cancer, you know, you, you, you have uh, a five-year uh, period when you can be free of it. Then it, it often re reappears. They can't even, de you, you know what's going on in the case of, um, Infantile paralysis is coming back on people who have been had infantile paralysis and, 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 and allegedly got better, came back. The point, obviously, and it's coming back with younger people as well, the point, obviously, I'm making is that, is that this is a way of thinking that literally believes that science and technology can solve all the problems. And the science that they have is essentially science of particulars, of, speci of specifics. I should stop um, with this conclusion. Unless and until social science, history, as well as so-called natural science, begins to address the problem of subjectivity and the relationship between technology, science, and subjectivity, the relationship between anti-intellectualism and war and all those kinds of large issues, that until, unless and until that begins to happen, we're going to have a lot of trouble, continuing trouble. And one of the worst part of that trouble is that going to be the, it's going to, people are going to say, I have cancer. I have heart disease. I was a failure. I couldn't find a decent job. Not you, me. We live in a situation in which there are, very, there are real serious problems that are not being significantly addressed. Some people believe, obviously, that it's a problem of the, uh, of the, of the uh, consumption and consumerism. That is to say, consumerism has taken over the, 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 the space of, um, 
of pleasure, of, 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 uh, of the intellect, and so on. I think that's partially true. But we have, but, we, but we're not thinking. In Heidegger's great book, being in time, I'm not going to talk about for the moment, but in his great book, what is called thinking? Heidegger says at the end, or all throughout the book, are we, are we thinking yet? Kids say when they're in the car, when we're driving in the car, the kids say, are we there yet? He's asking the question, are we thinking yet? And he comes to the conclusion that we are not thinking yet. <coughs> and what Stiegler and others have, in French social and philosophical theory have begun to address is the problem of why we're not thinking. And he, they argue that we're not thinking because we have been taken over by, uh, imp we have become, uh, uh, to a large extent, de-individualized, that we've become uh, conformist, that we've become technologically dominated. Marcuse took the same position, that we've become essentially one-dimensional. It's strange 50 years later to talk about one-dimensionality, but it's really, it's, it's worse now than it was 50 years ago, in my opinion. And so that's, that's my conclusion, and um, I, I'm sorry I don't have any solutions, but um, I think they're very important um, to, to, to think about what it is that, that we're facing, and I'll entertain questions. Thanks. All right. So we've got a little less than a half an hour. We usually end at 5.30, so I'll let you call on people. He was in a class that I addressed, by the way, in 1969. He remembers me, yeah. Hey, um, Adam, um, thank you very much for the talk. Could you speak a little louder? Yes, um, thank you very much for the thought-provoking um, speech. You have drawn um, quite a dark picture of <laughs> the cultural and psychoanalytic state of the humankind. Um, I would like to ask if you see any counter tendencies or con cultural and psychoanalytic contradictions that may provide some beams of light as you. That's a great question. Um, I know that what I presented was the critical side. And uh, I have to say that the first thing you have, that intellectually, uh, the best work that's being done is still critical. The best work. Some people, and Stiegler is among them, some people, intellectuals, are beginning to talk about solutions. They're talking about alternatives, not simply critiques. Um, what there isn't yet, and I think almost anywhere, I ha I would, I, I'll, I'll give you a couple of, of counter tendencies in a minute. What there isn't yet is at the social and the cultural level, a large questioning of the role of technology in society, a large questioning of the problem of the relationship between um, science, technology, and subjectivity and disease, for example, in the medical area. The one place where there is a counter tendency and it is a muffled counter tendency because it has no, it is not a large um, movement, <coughs> is that in, in the field of work, there is a, in this country as well as everywhere else, there is a new attempt to restore the concept of what C. Wright Mills talked about as craftsmanship. That is to say, to say, no, we're not going to be machinic anymore. 
we're going to try to actually produce things in a much more archaic way, that we're going to challenge the progressive view of technology by actually producing things that are really in many ways handcrafted or not entirely handcrafted and part handcrafted. You may find this strange, but you'll see this in, um, in uh, food, primarily. You'll find this in not only beer, uh, but you'll find it also in, um, in certain, um, in certain uh, uh, um, uh, other foods as well. There's a lot of questioning, for example, of, um, in, 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 in the fight on food. Um, both intellectually as well as in, in practice, about the, the use of genetic, genetically modified organisms, GMOs. That's true of Western Europe. It's also true of this country. Um, there's also a, 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 a new, Marian Nessel is among them, Michael Pohl is among them, a new attempt to really point out that we're, re we're eating a lot of poison in our everyday diets. So there's some of that going on. Um, the industry, the Archer Daniel Midlands and the Monsantos are still insisting that GMOs and scientists are being paid to say that GMOs are harmless. They're being paid to say that GMOs are harmless. Just as, and you probably, you, you probably know this as well, I hope you know it, that uh, uh, Coca-Cola gave a lot of money to uh, uh, obesity studies. Isn't that wonderful? And that the and the the the, 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 the medical establishment that went uh, for obesity involved in obesity said that uh, sugar is not the only major form uh, that, of obesity. Now they discontinued their con their contact with uh, um, Coca Cola after three and a half million dollars here and five million dollars there and seven million dollars. I'm giving you three numbers that are actual numbers that three of the of the institutes actually accept it. Um, um, so that at the level of work, at the level of, 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 of health and food, there, there, is, there is a certain amount of, of, of counter tendency. What I don't see, and maybe you, you can help me, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, there's not a single political force of any power, of any influence, including the left. I don't think by the left is the left is uh, is great on this stuff. You know, they're uh, either blind or, or or going along. There isn't a political force of any strength, Western Europe or here, or for that matter, in in, in most of the um, in most of the uh, Latin American and Asian countries that actually says, look. We have to, at the very minimum, this is minimum, we have to take a critical perspective, a critical look at technology. <coughs> we have to take <coughs> an understanding of the labor process. We have to take an understanding of the health field. We have to take an understanding of um, child development, of all kinds of things in order to be able to do stuff. We don't have a political force of any strength that even questions the specialization of education in this country, or for that matter in Western Europe. What you have to do is you have to present yourself as alternative and to a large extent as, you know, as experimental and, and, and small here and small there. That's fine. But you don't have any, any fight on these issues. Real fight. Capital has ruined the education system. Or, if you want to take the most pessimistic view, the American education system was ruined from the very beginning. But, I'm, I'm going to be optimistic, it's gotten much worse. <laughs> and one of the things we, well, it has. I mean, it's really, um, the University of Wisconsin was, and still to some extent is, an exception to a very large rule in higher education. It had a, it, its historians had a genuine critical perspective on the world. It had sociologists. It had uh, uh, 
political scientists. It had even some scientists who had some, some critical understanding. <coughs> that tendency is almost all over. It's not just the University of Wisconsin. It's, it's MIT and, 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 uh, and uh, other places like that. I mean, we're really in some, we're in deep doo-doo, according to the great philosopher George W. Bush. <laughs> Where we don't have a counter tendency that I can point out as 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 a, as a significant political or for that matter a, a significant educational force. Now, I will tell you this. However, we are, there are many people in this Western Europe and the United States, but particularly in Western Europe and Latin America, at least, who want to see genuine alternative perspectives on what constitutes the good life. At the end of my book, Death and Life of American Labor, by the way, which is selling a lot of copies, yeah, I have to tell you that for, for, for what it is. It, you know, it's not on the bestseller list, but it's selling, doing very well. I ask the question, does the labor movement have a conception of the good life? Because without a conception of the good life, that is to say, you know, as Marx says, the difference between a, an architect and a bee is that the architect has in his head a, a model, you know, a, a, a picture. We don't have the conception of the good life. We don't have alternatives. But now there are people beginning to raise the question of what that means. What is the good life? How would we begin to, to change things? There's an urbanist movement around the world about such things. There's, there's a people doing, in, um, in, um, in, in Argentina, there were people, in, in people who occupied factories so that they can start making goods themselves rather than having management. That's good stuff, but it's sporadic, and it's not yet matured. Yes? Um, I guess two questions. One is, uh, do you see a difference between technology that is uh, sort of organized and controlled by capital versus technology that is not. So the sort of Wikipedias, the 3D printers, the open source movement. Um, and then I guess if we have this huge uh, subjective wall to sort of break through, what does that mean for organizing strategies? Um, Good question. Now, two, it's the same question with two parts, right? Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Um, certainly, open source is better than the commercialization of the internet. Right? I mean, I won't deny that. Um, I use Mozilla instead of um, the window, you know, the, the Microsoft um, um, search engine. Yeah, um, you know, it's one of those things. It's like recycling. It doesn't do any good, but you do it because it makes you feel better. Um, uh, <laughs> um, you, there's a distinction. Heidegger makes a distinction between techne and technology. Techne is the un un uncovering of the unknown. And that has been with uh, with us for for millions of years, it, it, we always have tech, tech, technical uh, n means of of learning new things. So I'm not opposed to learning new things. Certain things I think we should not learn, but that's a separate. No, I mean it seriously. I, I actually called for that in my book, Science is Power, and I got slammed. What do you mean we shouldn't learn things? But the problem is, that if we don't exempt certain parts of the, of the universe, including the unconscious, from knowledge, then we will not be able to effectively fight domination. That's my view. But technology, capitalist technology, or for that matter, socialist technology, whatever that might mean, there's no possibility under capitalism the technology will not remain a form of domination. There's no possibility. It's getting worser and worser and worser. And the reason for that is because in the first place you have the, 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 the dream of capital is to have the workerless factory. 
notwithstanding the problem of surplus value. Well, what, how do you get surplus value when you don't have labor, you know, labor power making the product? Then you have manipulation of money, and you have fictitious capital, and you have all sorts of other things. But the second reason is because if technology under capitalism is about the subordination of people and about the use of the human body as a commodity, continual, that's what the medical industry is really all about, then it's not going to happen under capitalism. So that, therefore, my conclusion is until we have a significant, and I'm not going to use the word socialism because socialism has had its day, in my opinion. Until we have a conversation about how we change the system and in what direction that system has to be changed, then the possibility of technologies that would be, or technical means that would be advantageous to ordinary people is not going to be possible. In other words, the, the new technology will have to be connected to new society. Okay? Now, That is a possibility now because the number of individual critics of technology is growing. Um, but so far, it's been very, very difficult to envision any, any organizations, any movements of significant power to be able and willing to take up those kinds of, of critiques and make them connected to social change. But let me make one point here, because this is really the main point. One of the arguments that is being made by French social theory, and I would argue that that was also true of the Frankfurt School, um, is that the capacity of human beings to be able to conceive of alternatives that are both temporally relevant and politically possible, that capacity has been so diminished that the best that we can get now is resistance and protest. The concept of alternatives is almost impossible to think about any longer without a hundred million objections because of the, of the history. You can't simply talk about socialism or communism in a naive way anymore. You just can't do it. Uh, people are trying to do that, but Drew's trying to do that, and other people, you know, philosopher, French philosopher. Um, but I don't know whether that's possible. We have to actually begin to think about alternatives that haven't been thought about before. And the problem is that as long as we don't critique the, the influences on subjectivity, that is to say, as long as we don't have a conception of how serious is the phenomenon of specialization and all that on people's lives, unless we don't, and, 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 to, and to combine the two senses of political economy, the libidinal economy and the traditional economy, with the psychological and the, um, and the um, uh, social dimensions, then we're gonna, not going to go very far. We're not going to get there. We keep falling back. We have economists who can't even think of, of, of any solutions any longer, and the economists are the, are the, uh, are, are the pinnacle of what is, constitutes good social science. You see, are you an economist? No. Oh, good. <laughs> 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 but you know what I'm saying. And, and now, now here, here, here's the, here's, this is my prejudice. I don't think it's a prejudice. It's the way I think. Um, there was a lot wrong with the concept of the totality that comes out of Marx and the concept of the totality that was developed by George Lukács. It was serious problems because it didn't take into account a number of different phenomena, one of which is the complexity of class structure. Uh, we have a very complicated class structure. We have two, two dimensions of classes. We have economic classes and we have cultural classes and they have never, uh, they have never literally uh, uh, theorized that. I have in a book called How Class Works, by the way. Nobody pays attention to that book. Well, it does all right, but nobody pays attention. We have different you know, ideas about class. But the one thing that they did have 
is that they try to develop a concept of the totality, of the relationship between economic, social, political, and psychological phenomena. That that relationship was, inter it was, was intimate. And Siegel is trying to do it now. He doesn't talk enough, he has a book called Towards a New Political Economy. Which is, it's an interesting book. How do you integrate the libidinal economy with the traditional economy? But, the, but, but, but it's not yet taken hold. That's the problem. It's not yet become a property of any political and social movements. It, doesn't, it hasn't happened. People still talk nationalism and, you know, the old shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about separate. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about nationalism. Uh, anyway, any further questions? Yep. Um, I was you got, you can you stand up and speak sure, louder? Yeah. I'm sorry. Of course. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about um, collective subjectivity and your thoughts on um, you know where we stand now in terms of, of social movements um, kind of constituting themselves um, and taking up robust political demands. Um, you know, there's a certain strain of thought that criticizes the kind of more horizontal, anarchist-inspired um, resistance um, around the, you know, the WTO protests and these kinds of things, Occupy Wall Street, that it's, it, there's a certain chauvinism um, that says these things aren't yet mature, these things aren't yet um, consolidated around a real you know, concept of political subjectivity. Um, I'm wondering if, um, what, what you kind of think about that strain of thought, um, if there's something that we've learned um, since the critique of um, uh, a sort of uh, simplistic class uh, analysis or sim simplistic um, sort of political analysis um, from the 20th century. Um, if there's anything that um, kind of be brought forward from some of these new experiments uh, in social movements and okay. organization. <clears throat> a, a genuine social movement, as opposed to a movement around a specific de set of demands that is speci so specific that they could be resolved uh, by those in power. A genuine social movement creates a situation in which the entire culture of that particular space, like a nation, or maybe even a part of a nation, has to deal with. A social movement, and I'll give examples in a second, a social movement is not simply an act of protest or resistance, it's an act of people who are saying, we have a demand which is sufficiently powerful that you have to address it. Okay, I'm going to give you three examples. The Black Freedom Movement <clears throat> of the 1950s and 1960s, because of its direct action, because of its disruption, because of its, ref its civil disobedience, because of its uh, occupying uh, spaces that it was not, that were against the law, forced the entire country, the United States, to address its demands. That was a social movement. And it was an ongoing social movement which had internally a number of different fact, uh, factions, one of which was a um, more radical faction, which was for direct action. It had a more conservative faction, which was the NAACP, which was only for legal, legal, legal um, uh, uh, resolution. But it was a social movement because it, it, forced, it forced that kind of change. Second, of course, was the feminist movement. And the feminist movement had factions. It had a radical faction. It had a, um, a liberal faction, very much like the NAA, which I call conservative, not because it's conservative ideologically, but it's conservative in its strategy and, it's, and it's, it's even its demands. But the feminist movement developed a line which challenged 
a very important part of Catholicism and a very important part of evangelical Protestantism, which was specifically on the problem of abortion. But it wasn't just abortion. They were, ra they were raising the question of new relationship between men and women and new relationship for sexuality more generally than the relationship between men and women. So you had transgender issues and you had you know, uh, uh, issues of gay and lesbian rights and all that that developed through the feminist movement and around the feminist movement. And they, they took sides. But generally speaking, it was the feminist movement that has resulted in all of this all of the changes that you've seen in this country. And it took decades, and it took struggle. Homophobes, homophobes had to change their views within the feminist movement. There were people in the feminist movement who said the basic issue for women is changing the relations of the bedroom. And if you don't change the relations of the bedroom, you're not changing a whole lot. It's not about legal rights. It's not about you know whether Carly uh, can become the uh, uh, CEO of, 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 of Hewlett Packard. That's not what the feminist movement is primarily about. But there were others like, like the late Betty Friedan, the later Betty Friedan, who said the real issue was, you know, how do we gain legal rights and all that kind of stuff. So you had those splits. But the fact is that they were a genuine social movement because they were raising some fundamental problems of the relationships between people. Race on the one side was the, was the black freedom movement, and sexuality on the other side was the feminist movement. I'm going to now say what I think is a failed social movement. Occupy, I've written about extensively. You, have you read my stuff on Occupy? No? Well, I tell you, I've written a lot. You can, you can get it. Uh, yeah. Hold on. The failed social movement is the ecological movement. Because what happened in the ecological movement, it got taken over by the uh, Democratic Party. The Democratic Party runs the ecological movement. It's not an, it's not an autonomous movement anymore. It's got you know, organizations that are more independent than others. But essentially, it's looking for changes of the law. And it's looking to the, it looked, especially since 2008, to the Obama administration and before that, uh, even to the Clinton administration for changes. It did not have a, a social base. It wasn't a social movement. It was, a, it was an elite movement with some activists. More than some, but you know, it was not, it didn't have a, it didn't, it didn't have a sense of what the ecological crisis would mean in terms of the transformation of the entire society. The problem with the ecological movement is unfair, in fact, as compared to the feminist and the black freedom movement, is that the ecological movement cannot avoid, if it's ever going to become an effective social movement, taking on capitalism. It cannot avoid it. You cannot solve the problem at this point. At this point, but maybe, maybe never. You cannot solve the, solve the problem of global warming, of climate change, until you've actually solved the problem of capitalism. And that's what they refuse to do, and therefore they've fallen back on a variety or another of liberal, piecemeal, uh, small-scale solutions, like recycling. <laughs> um, you know, but um, but it's an example of a failure, and 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 the and the problem the problem is that if that movement is ever going to develop, it's going to have to rely not on the Bill McKill McKibbins, who is a, a liberal reformer. It's going to have to look to much more deeply <clears throat> to people like Joel Covell and people like Murray Bookchin, who was an anarchist, and it's going to have to actually begin to expand its understanding of what produces the ecological crisis against which it is trying to fight. And then it's going to have to become a revolutionary movement. And maybe it's also true that whatever radical movement will develop will have to be, in the first place, an ecological movement. So anyway, that's, that's the short answer. Uh, well, oh, that was my question. All right. <laughs> okay. I guess that's it, huh? Thank you. All right.